Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Our Heavenly Father, as we have just heard this retelling of the work of our Saviour 2,000 years ago, we praise you that nothing in this world is outside of your power and that you worked for good and that you will work to good for good. Please let us hear your voice. And today, we ask you that we might be able to hear your voice in this passage from 1 Corinthians. Be with me that I might explain it properly. Be with us as we hear it. And by your spirit, be at work to change us. Amen. Well, as I just prayed, we're back into 1 Corinthians 7. And it's been a bit of a disrupted series. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I began this three-week series. Uh, it was in Combined Chapel. It was on a Tuesday. And a number of you were at General Synod. And a few of you were gravely ill as well. Uh, after that service, uh, one wag actually said they're not sure which was the worst. Uh, but anyway, we're all back here together. And that couple of weeks ago, uh, as we looked at 1 Corinthians 6, uh, I pointed out that the Siri world that we now see as normal, where you actually have a significant relationship uh, with a disembodied voice, where that voice tells you what to wear and what to do today, is not Christian at all. Embodiment is crucial to our human existence. And we saw at the end of chapter 6, even at that most amazing act of God, that is what the Apostle calls our union with Christ, the union is between the Creator and the creation. The union is between a sinner and the unblemished, perfect God. And that union is an act of embodiment. And so we saw in chapter 6, verse 15, our bodies are members of Christ himself. And then as chapter 6 came to a close, in no uncertain terms, the apostle aimed his razor-sharp words on embodiment to the topic of sex. And there he said bluntly and as clearly as possible, flee sexual immorality. Sexual sin is disastrous not just for the church that is the temple of God, but also for you and for me individually as we are the temple of God. And I'm not going to revisit that sermon, but I want us to move now into chapter 7 where the apostle writes about what this embodied life looks like and how we relate in marriage. Now, marriage is a topic that matters very much to us. Some of you are married. All of us will minister to people who are married. And marriage gets so little attention and we get so little help from our world because we get such conflicting advice on it. Whether to get married, how to get married, the value of marriage, how do you grow in marriage, and so much these days is written on how to leave marriage well. It's no wonder that in the first 20 years of this century, marriages have declined by 25%. And even with that decline, still 40% of marriages end in divorce. And so with so little help from our society about marriage, we must turn to the Bible and do what it says. But even as Christians turn to the Bible to do what it says about marriage, we read that divorce rates are only slightly better amongst Christians than for the rest of society. And then you ask yourself the question, are we not reading the Bible? Are we not paying attention to it? And are we not applying it properly? And so I want to explore that with you today. And I want to begin in exploring that question by asking you to be in the shoes of a friend of mine and to think about what you would do if you were in his shoes. It actually happened 26 years ago, so the shoes are a bit old. Uh, 26 years ago, 26 months ago, sorry. Um, he, he and his family were visiting friends in Italy. They were experiencing a fairly cold holiday but things were beginning to warm up, which was good because the next phase of their holiday was a short break around Lake Como, and his family and he were very much looking forward to it. 
And then within hours of arriving at Lake Como, his world was turned upside down. First, there were three cases of COVID that were reported in the media. And then within that week, before he could do anything about it, that whole nation was closed down. He and his family weren't permitted to leave home. His wife and his kids were confined to their tiny flat. They couldn't speak Italian, so they didn't know what was going on. They had no help in navigating what they should do. The option to return to Australia was gone. They were trapped in Italy, both by the Italian government and by the Australian government, and they had no idea whether they would be trapped there for days or weeks or months or even years. The supermarkets and pharmacies were the only thing that were open. Everything else was closed. What would he do? And the hospitals. Hospitals weren't taking anybody else who was ill because they were packed to the gunnels anyway. And what would happen if one of his kids got sick? It was a very scary time for him. What would you do if you were in his shoes back in Lake Como at the beginning of 2020? How would you respond? Well, my friend now looks back and he says he didn't think for a moment about what the right thing to do was. He didn't even think about what he should do. He wasn't interested in thinking, oh, these are pretty good rules, uh, or even why they were there. He saw the rules as something that he had to get on top of, had to understand, and then find a workaround from the rules if that was necessary. He didn't consider who would benefit from the rules. All he wanted to know was what he could possibly be allowed to do and get away with. Given those rules and those limitations, he tried to manage himself and his family as best he could to manipulate things to bring about the best for his family. And so he said to me, all he wanted to know is what are the rules, what are the boundaries that these rules do, and how rubbery are those boundaries? Where can I push those boundaries to get a better outcome for my family? And he said, I didn't even care what it meant for other people. And I want to I give you that example because his experience, that is the experience of uncertainty, the experience of difficulty, of not liking the situation, of the confusion he found himself in, led him to respond in ways, embodied ways, that difficult circumstances often lead us to do. That is, our thinking gets very, very narrowed. If you break your arm, all you can think about is the pain of that. And so it was for my friend, and I want to say to it, as, as we think about this confusing world that we are in and how we relate in marriage, it is very easy for us to actually narrow down our thinking. And so with that, we now turn to chapter 7. And I want you to move from wearing my friend's shoes to first century Corinthian sandals. And that is, it's less than a generation after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's less than a generation after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So there is very, very little Christian history. There is no long-term accepted Christian practice. Christian tradition does not exist. All you have is the way your society and your culture have operated. And this is a culture that you live in that is unaffected by the regenerating work of Christ. You don't have a society that is Christian. You've got a society that is pagan. If anything, it is anti-Christian. How do you live in that? You're living in Corinth, which is a wicked city, and yet you are washed, you have been sanctified, you have been sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You are a new creation. What do you do? How do you live in that sort of setting? You are unique. Just save it for a moment. You are a different being to everybody else in the city. How do you live in that setting? And particularly... How do you relate in marriage in that setting? You can't say, well, the church says this, or look, these people have been Christians for a long time, do that. Everything is new for you. Your bodies are united to Christ and they're to be used to glorify him. So what does that mean for marriage? You see, embracing the great transformative gospel means that, I hope, their head and their heart is set on heaven and not on earthly things. But what does it mean in the here and now for your embodied relationship? 
And so those believers in Corinth who are experiencing a whole new world, a whole new reality, are travelling in uncharted waters. And it's much more radical than navigating those anxious and uncertain earliest days of COVID in Italy. What would you do in your marriage? Because they had no playbook, no person to watch or copy, <coughs> no one else to try and help you. And then, into this setting, the church receives the letter, which we call 1 Corinthians from the Apostle Paul, a letter that speaks about this very situation. What a relief. When it comes, though, I suspect this letter was a little bit like my friend in COVID Italy. That is, you can read it to find out what the rules are. You can read it to find out what to do. And as you read it, you can demand that everyone else in the church does what the rules demand. Or, if you don't like what is being written, you try to find the workaround. But the problem is with that is that it doesn't take into account everyone's different embodied situation. See, it might work for COVID. In COVID, when we just had to try and keep a lid on the transmission, everybody had to do the same thing. But everybody's situation wasn't the same. And I had other friends who had to say goodbye to family who were dying through a window and they could only stand there for two minutes. They couldn't hold the hand of their loved one. And it doesn't take into account the different situations that people are in. So what I want to say to us this morning is we must pay attention to the rules because the rules that God gives are good. But don't think it is only rules. God gives us our embodiment and we are in different situations and in different circumstances and in different sets of relationships. And you need to pay attention to that. And what is, that is what the Apostle is going to speak of today. And I know here today, even though a number of people are absent, there's a variety of relationships. Some of you are single and happily single. Some of you are single and unhappily single. Some of you, for all sorts of honourable and noble reasons, have decided to abstain from marriage. Some of you are married and are happily married. And some of you are married and desperately striving to improve your marriage. And here the Apostle gives advice and gives rules about how to function in marriage, but those, ones, those rules can help us to understand how we live in our embodied relationships, whatever they might be. So your particular situation might not be co uh, covered by the Apostle's words, but what he does is gives us ways of understanding how we relate in any of our embodied relationships. So I want to quickly remind us of what Paul says here, about what we must do if we are married and then step back and see what the principles are. So let's just work through these first few verses of chapter 7 together. First one. Now for the matters that you wrote about, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. From that you can see the sorts of things that are going on in the Corinthian church. What should we do about sex is their question. They're probably saying something like, look, given all of this immorality that is going on around us, it's easiest and good for a man not to have sex. And of course, the assumption here in this verse is that it's sex with a woman with his wife. And you can see that reasoning with so much immorality. Let's put up a wall. Let's prevent immorality. Let's abstain from sex. But verse 2, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Yeah, that's right, there is sexual immorality, but the answer is not abstinence. Abstinence doesn't always work. It actually promotes, sometimes, sexual immorality. So the first thing that Paul commands married people here is to have sex, but to have sex with only your own wife. And in fact, it is not just one-way traffic. Wives are to have sex with their own husbands. You see, sex is not just about bodily gratification. It's for the context of relationships 
of married relationships, it's to be shared and it's to be shared with your spouse. And this pleasurable act of embodiment, so in a world that is so full of sexual immorality, helps people to be pure. That is, the temple of the Lord might be pure. That's why they are to engage in sex. And notice that the marriage relationship is not about you and not even about your need for sex to stay free from sexual immorality. The man has a duty, duty, see that powerful word, duty to his wife, and the wife has a duty to her husband. Verse 3, the husband should fulfil his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Your embodiment, you have a duty to use that for the sake, for the benefit, for the blessing of your wife. And I've got to say, men, what an honour that is. It lifts sex from merely the fulfilment of those bodily urges to serving another person. And you say, well, what does that duty look like? Verse 4. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but yields it to the wife. Duty is not about demanding from another person. It is not about power or control or authority. In fact, the Apostle Paul explicitly condemns in this very verse that idea of power, control and authority. The duty you have is to yield, to willingly and freely give up. It's not about power, but about service. It's not about demand, but about benefiting the other. And men, I hope I don't need to say it, but that means I must say it, make sure you read the whole of verse 4. Yes, your wife has a duty to you. Your wife serves you. But in the same way, you are to use your body to serve your wife. She owns you. And so here, in the act of sex, there is absolute equality. Our sinful world for both men and women, take the wonderful blessing of sex and they weaponise it so that sex can so easily lead to intimate partner violence and it occurs even in Christian marriage. Violence and abuse of sex. The abuse by demanding sex, the abuse by withholding sex is a terrible thing. It's an arrogant demand, or it's a contriving and abusing power so that you might control another person. You do not have authority over your body. It's your partner's body. Your body is your partner's body, and her body is yours too. You belong to each other. And so Paul says, make sure you don't deprive each other of sex. Your job is to use your body to seek the pleasure of your partner, not your own pleasure. And so, brothers, be very, very thoughtful. But having said that, it's not all about rules either. If that were the case, the chapter would end here and Paul would stop speaking. Because he says, while you make sure you have sex so that you might not go down the pathway of sexual immorality, there are times where it is right to abstain from sex. Obviously, you must abstain from sex, all sex outside of marriage, but even within marriage, there are times where it is right to abstain from sex. And so as you read verses 1 to 4, you also need to read verses 5 and 6. Don't deprive each other, oh, except perhaps by mutual consent, and for a time, so that you might devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And I say this as a concession, not as a command. So there are times where you abstain, but you abstain by agreeing to abstain. You abstain not for an extended period of time, 
and you abstain for a good reason, in this case, to devote yourself to prayer. But then come together again and have sex because we must recognise our human embodiedness and the way that Satan can use that to destroy the purity of the temple of God. So, some conclusions about marriage that we can take into all of our relationships. Firstly, marriage is for the other's benefit. Sex is a means of enhancing yours and your partner's purity and using your body to enhance their purity is always for their benefit. And so in our embodied relationships, we need to learn from this. Our relationships, while every one of our relationships is a blessing for us, they are given by God for the benefit of the other person. So stop thinking about yourself in relationships. All our relationships are so that we might benefit other people. And the way that we benefit others is to help them to grow in their purity. Do what is at your disposal to prevent them taking the pathway to immorality. You see, in our world, we keep saying that people make their own choices and therefore they have to bear the consequences of their decisions. And I want to say that is true. But we must also learn to consider giving up our rights so that others might benefit so that they might begin to walk down that pathway of greater purity rather than immorality. And so these rules given by the Apostle for those who are married are excellent rules to live by, but there is that flexibility that comes in the application of them. You cannot just say, this is what you must do in every situation. We've already seen that, so have sex, but it's right for season to abstain. And as powerful and as good as sex is, it's actually not the most important part of our embodied relationship. Purity is what matters in relationships because we are united body and soul to God and our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So we'll look a little bit more next week at various different situations. But here, let's have a look at, as we go to verse 16, at some of the things the Apostle says, uh, having said these things in verses 1 to 5. So verse 6, verse 7. I wish that all of you were as I am, that is, abstaining from sex, but each of you has their own gift from God. One has this gift and another one has a different sort of gift. That is... Know how you are wired by God concerning your sexual urges. If you can abstain from, sex, from the need for sex, well, that's good. But don't think that you are more holy by doing so, or the person who can't is less holy. But abstaining from sex frees you up to be more focused. And to those that are currently unmarried, he gives the same advice, verse 8. Now, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it's good for them to stay unmarried as I do, but if they can't control themselves, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So the first one is, understand the way you are wired. Secondly, part of embodied purity is faithfulness in relationship. You cannot just go flitting around and onto new relationships when you feel like it and ignore previous relationships <coughs> and previous promises. You must not do that and especially not do it with your spouse. And here is a direct command from God to you. Verse 10. To the married, I, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from a husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband must not divorce his wife. Thirdly, what about relationships of marriage that is a relationship between a believer and an un unbeliever. That situation would have been so, so common in the earliest church. One of the partners comes to faith, the other doesn't believe. You are heading in completely different directions. You've got different sets of moral values, you've got different hopes, you've got a different Lord that you serve. What do you do? Well, despite all of these differences, you have made promises to your spouse and so you keep them. 
the promise matters more than your ease does. And add to that, add to that necessity of keeping your promise, the sovereignty of God. Because it is never accidental that you're married to a person who is an unbeliever. And perhaps God has done this to bring them to salvation. Now, both these things are true. That is keeping of promises and the sovereignty of God. But you won't find a verse that brings those two together when it talks about marriage. And so Paul declares that he's saying it, though not for a moment does he think that this is not the mind of God. So let me read to you verses 12 to 16. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who isn't a believer and she's willing to live with him, he mustn't divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who's not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she mustn't divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean. But as it is, they're holy. But if an unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you'll save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And so then, brothers, there is so much to say. There's so many questions. We want to keep pushing the boundaries on this, don't we? And I'm not going to deal with that now, but recognise the desires of our own hearts in these difficult circumstances. Where we can conclude is, pray about your situation in life with your embodied relationships that God has given you. And I want to say to me and to you, think very carefully and deeply and regularly about how you can use those embodied relationships that God has given us for the purity of others. Pray for those that you share embodiment with, the one you share sexually with in your marriage, but also in all the different sets of relationships as every one, every human being will want to self-satisfy, be self-satisfied, and that is not what we are embodied for. When life is difficult, when life is messy and complicated, the clear commands of God are a very great help to us. But because messiness and difficulty means that we just either want to apply them thoughtlessly to everyone or to seek ways to wriggle out of them, God's way is always best. And God's way is to live in our embodied relationships so that purity might prevail. Because wonderfully, how do you describe yourself? I can describe myself as Archie. I can describe myself as faculty here at college. But it's unbelievable you and I are described as temples of the Holy Spirit. There is no greater title that can be given than that to an embodied being, is it? Temple of the Holy Spirit. Ensure the temple remains pure and let our temples under God's good hand be like the Jerusalem temple and the temple that walked amongst men to be used to provide blessings that come to everybody who comes near. Let's pray. Our Lord God, in all of our circumstances of life, we ask you that we might be granted wisdom to not walk down the pathway of immorality. To those of us that are married, we thank you for the joy of sex and we ask you that we might use that embodied joy to be a blessing to our spouse. And for all of us in all of the different circumstances of life, please let us use our embodied relationships that we might be a blessing to other people, a blessing that is shaped by seeking purity on their behalf. Amen.